at least as we begin. And I'm glad that no one else really is around but the Lord and you and me. So as we talk, I don't think we will get into too much trouble. Maybe as John Lewis said, we'll get into some good trouble. Because today we are going to have a conversation that might go against some of your most deeply held beliefs. And I know that according to the way that many of us mainline Christians approach our faith and given the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter seven about not judging unless we want to be judged, which informs so much of how we think we ought to practice our faith, given Jesus' admonition in that text, many of us believe that as we live for the Lord, we ought to first look for ways to sweep the junk from out in front of our own front doors. We believe this, at least in theory. We believe that we ought to make sure that the log that is in our own eyes is taken care of before even thinking about placing anyone else's behavior under a microscope, a church microscope of scrutiny and critique. We believe that as nice Christians, we ought to look in the mirror, mirror of life more than combing and probing through anyone else's life and their actions, at least ideally. But given that just for a few moments, it is just you and it's me here in the room and on Zoom, and as God is present, as God is present, as grace and mercy, Let's be bold and let's do something out of the norm, carefully and cautiously. Let, let's do something that might be a little bit unconventional and that stretches us theologically. And, and for a few mo mo minutes, maybe we can get by just for a few minutes by looking at the stuff out in front of other folks' doors for a grand and larger purpose. Maybe we can just briefly think about the spiritual walk or walks of others and the growing edges of others as we try to settle an important question that must be answered. So, so I gotta remind myself, shh, not too loudly. <laughs> Here it goes. Just between you and me, uh, have you ever wondered why someone who has claimed to be a Christian for about the same amount of time as another person who has claimed to be a Christian, both hypothetical church members join the church about the same time, in the same year, 10 years ago? And hypothetically, they are two people who have come from similar backgrounds, two people who have heard similar sermons over the years. And yet, have you ever wondered why, without really trying to notice, that, that one follower of Christ now seems to be much further along in their walk with the Lord than the other? Even though they started their journeys with the Lord about the same time, even though they had catechism about the same time. Uh, of course, uh, we do know that no one's walk is exactly the same as another person's walk. No one's journey is exactly the same. We know that. But in the scenario that I am trying to describe, the maturity level 10 years later in one sister is now miles apart from the other sister both of whom were baptized a decade ago. So have, have you ever wondered what is the key factor in different spiritual growth rates 
And what is one of the main reasons why one brother who converts will grow and begin living the teachings of his faith and exhibit a walk in the Holy Spirit and will begin to manifest a brand new life and they will, he will adopt new values and a new center. He will repent quickly when he sins. He will fix what comes out of his mouth to fit his understanding of Christ's lordship. He will begin to make a dating or begin to make dating decisions that are based in the word of God. He will begin to make sex related decisions based on the word of God and business decisions and political decisions and vocational choices and spending choices and entertainment choices based on his understanding of Christ's lordship. While the other brother who claims to follow the same Christ and who converted about the same time does not seem to know how or does not even seem to care how to exhibit the character, the attitude, the ministry of Christ in any substantial way at all. This kind of brother, the second brother is still running the streets with no signs of slowing down, though they are, he is an officer in the house of faith, or he's still professing his faith, but he's mean as a junkyard dog, or he's still slow to forgive and quick to accuse. Outside of the church, this person has nothing that distinguishes distinguishes them from those who don't even claim to know Jesus at all. So what causes one to lean more toward the treasure of Christ? You know, Paul wrote in our text that we've got this treasure in clay jars. What causes one to lean more toward the treasure in the clay jar? And, and what causes another to lean more on the trash? that surrounds the clay jar. Now, now, as I raise this central question, I know that I'm walking on shaky ground and I must tread carefully and speak carefully because I am aware that we have all fallen short of the glory of God from time to time. We all blow it. We all have had moments of rebelling. We all yield to the voice of temptation every now and then. And along with this fact, I am on unstable ground because it is not polite for us in mainline church circles, in Presbyterian and United Methodist, and I've gone down the list earlier. It is not polite for us to gaze at and speak out loud about the lack of spiritual growth and signs, the, the need for the sign of conversion in others. Th this is a no-no. This seems unseemly and unsophisticated at best and spiritually dangerous at worst. This keeping account of why someone seems to be stagnant in comparison to someone else, goes against our nice religious sensibilities. And it might even go against some good theology because often we don't have enough facts about what lies behind the visible presentation of another person's life and life's choices to make a sound judgment. Often we can't see good enough we can't see far enough. We can't see deep enough to discuss why someone else has a moat in their eye or why Billy is still struggling and why Brenda is still bitter. And again, I know that none of us can claim to be exempt from ever having missed the mark in our lives ourselves. However, and again, it's just us. So we can keep it real. And Jesus did say in the same chapter, this is curious, Jesus did say in the same chapter of Matthew, Matthew chapter 7, just a few verses down from his teaching about don't judge, which really means don't condemn. Don't condemn unless you want to be condemned. He does say in the same breath, in the same Sermon on the Mount, that we ought to make sure 
that we aren't following false prophets and false Christians because some folks can be wolves in sheep's clothing. And on, the only way to know whether or not we, you, all of us are dealing with wolves or sheep is by checking out their behavior and by checking out their spiritual fruit. Now, we're not to be professional fruit inspectors, but we have been called to open our eyes and just see what kind of fruit is growing on the tree. What kind of fruit are you talking about, preacher? I'm talking about the fruit of the spirit that Paul lists in Galatians 5. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, self-control. Jesus does, does say that even Presbyterians and other mainliners will know trees by the fruit that they bear. So I believe that there is a hint, and we have just enough wiggle room and what Jesus purportedly taught right after he taught about getting rid of the plank in our eyes first so that we can help others be clear about who they are. I think that there's just enough um, truth there. There's just enough complexity there. Well, every now and then we do have to observe how those who are around us and those who are claiming to be leaders among us, I mean, isn't this nomination time for nominating offices in the church? It's important during this period that we do some, some self-reflection first, but then some observation and we can just think, well, what kind of fruit have I seen? Not only in my own life, because we checked there first. But then we also have to open our eyes. We can't close our eyes. We got to open our eyes and say, what kind of fruit am I seeing in this potential officer's life? Oh, okay. So with the earlier caveat and caution already acknowledged, uh, let, let me stop beating around the bush. What is the difference that sets apart the growing saint from the stagnant saint? What makes the difference in the church member who is on fire for God and the church member who wants to retire from God? What is the difference that separates maturing saints from folk who might just be very religious ain'ts? Excuse my bad English. It is the difference something that can be identified and isolated and then used to teach and help all of us and push all of us toward greater spiritual growth <clears throat> and maturity. Because the word of God to the Corinthian Christians says that every Christian has hidden treasure, a treasure of spiritual power that must be revealed day by day by day. Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his classic work seem to have identified a problem with regard to what we're talking about. In his book entitled, The Cost of Discipleship, he said that the problem regarding what we have been discussing so far is that the church has bought into the notion of cheap grace. This is when grace, which is the divine unmerited favor and unmerited power of God given to cover us, but not just cover us when we messing up, but it has been designed to give us the power to help us to succeed. God's divine grace. It is, Bonhoeffer said, when God's grace costs God everything. But that same grace requires absolutely nothing from us. He calls this cheap grace. And it, it leaves us convinced that once we are saved or once we join the church, we've got it made in the shade. Once the waters of baptism have been wiped off of us and the waters dry, we don't have to change. We don't have to really follow the Lord. We don't have to submit to the spirit or to church oversight. We don't have to be nice or play nice. We don't have to treat others as we would desire others to treat us. Bonhoeffer said that's, that's the problem right there. It's cheap grace. Renita Weems chimes in. A great womanist scholar. In her book entitled Listening for God, she suggests that there is another problem. She implies that the problem is that we have stopped listening to God and we are too entrenched in old and too conservative and fundamentalist understandings of what God requires. 
And as she testifies about her own life in the book, she implies that we need to open ourselves up to God's newness and not condemn ourselves and that we ought to broaden our understanding of the scriptures and become more progressive in our interpretations of the scriptures and less literal, more liberative and less judgmental. We have stopped listening for God or to God, she says. Dr. King also has a word in his sermon entitled Transform Nonconformist. In his book entitled Strength to Love, which is a book, which is a collection of his sermons. In one of his sermons, he said that the problem is we are conforming to this world. We are being shaped and molded by the world more than we're being shaped and molded by the spirit of God. The world says go right, so we go right. The world says go left, so we go left. The world says accept this, so we accept that. The world says reject this, so we reject that. We call good evil and evil good based on the dictates of this world system. Instead of bowing down to injustice and the grabbing of power and racism, Dr. King said that God wants us transformed and does not want us to conform. And he's coming from the scripture that Paul wrote to the Corinthian church. Be not conformed to the world system, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And, and there's something about the, the point Dr. King is making that resonates with me. I think King had his finger on the pivotal issue and problem as he alludes to the renewing of our mind for inner transformation. I don't wanna to sound too simplistic, but I am willing to wager that more times than not, the difference between the two believers, hypothetical believers we've mentioned earlier, who start their journey at the same time, but one ends up falling off the wagon or out of the race entirely is simply this. One person has internalized that God wants to sanctify them. That means set them apart. So they are being renewed day by day in their minds. And they have believed that God desires to renew their personalities, reorient their character, transform the way they come about decisions, the way they perceive reality. They believe that God has them enrolled in a renewal program. Have you been enrolled in God's renewal program? God has enrolled them and they believe it in this renewal program to draw them closer, to heal their hurts, to clean them up. And consequently, they have embraced a process of inner renewal, inner transformation and sanctification day by day by day. And the other hypothet hypothetical Christian simply has not. The other Christian is not convinced that being a Christian takes all of that. They seem to think that their initial confession of faith, their baptism and joining, joining the church was the main and ultimate goal. Almost like, nah, because they've joined the church, they got a ticket to heaven based on what Jesus did for them on Calvary. And that's all they need to be concerned about. But their minds are not renewed. They aren't seeking to renew their minds and they doubt the efficacy of going through the process. Let me ask the question again. Are you enrolled? Are you engaged in God's renewal program? And whenever and wherever our minds have not been renewed, this is true for the preacher, all the way to the back pew. Whenever and wherever our minds have not been collectively and individually renewed, we will see more of the sinful nature on display than we see outward signs and manifestations of an authentic connection with the inner treasure who is Jesus Christ. L listen, sisters and brothers, I, I have seen a thing or two in the life of God's church and I have not tried to be one who goes around looking for the moat in other people's eyes. I've had enough moats and planks in my own eye. But because I have been in church 
for more than a hot minute, I have not been able to help from seeing clear indications that sometimes the inner work, the inner treasure is not showing up in the church's outer behavior because there isn't enough renewal of the heart and mind taking place among God's people. I don't know about you, but over 35 years, maybe almost 38 years or more, I have heard and witnessed folk in the church cussing in anger at other church folk inside and outside the precincts of the church. I have seen church leaders base their level of commitment on Sundays in the fall and winter months on whether or not they had season tickets to the local professional football team. This was bad in Indianapolis with the Colts. I mean, we had leaders who would want to go see Peyton Manning and the boys more than they wanted to hear about Jesus Christ and his boys and girls. I'm, I don't mean to be uh, disrespectful to those adults who were following Jesus, but they were more concerned about those men on the field than Jesus' men and women on the field who set examples for us in the gospel. I have heard and witnessed folk in the church who, when they couldn't get their way or couldn't be the star of the church show or their relatives couldn't be the star of whatever show they thought was playing in the ministry life of the church. You know, sometimes we fall into the misunderstanding and we believe that church programs and ministry is really a show. I, I have seen those same folks start bad-mouthing the entire church, including elders and deacons and preachers and even this preacher. When new members would join, there would be a sister or a brother who would then, an uh, offended sister or brother, who would call up the new member and say, you know what, they're not going to let you do this, that, or the other, just like, like they didn't let me do. I've seen that. I've witnessed, I've heard that. I've talked to new members who said, Pastor, did you, did you know that there's a woman in the church? She gave me a call and she, got, she thought she was giving me a heads up, but she almost was making my head go down. I have heard and seen people threaten each other with physical harm. Church members running to their purses to get their Glock to settle a dispute, a situation, settling it in the worst way possible, right on the property, not on the property, right inside the church. We have hidden treasure. We, we have hidden treasure in the secret place of invisibility in the heart and soul, but it in order to properly display the treasure of divinity on the inside, Outwardly, consistently, we've got to renew our minds. We, we've got to renew our minds. I, I've got to renew my mind. You've got to renew your mind. We've got to renew our minds because even after we come to Christ, our minds still have memories. Our minds have been trained to think a certain way. We still have strongholds of the fallen sinful nature erected right in our thinking attached and ingrained. We've got old traditions that don't have anything to do with Jesus or the liberation of God's people that hold us captive. You, you see, we are spirit, we are soul or mind, and we are body. We are spirit, we are soul or mind, but we're also body, all interconnected. And when we give our lives over to, over to Christ, we are given a brand new spirit. That, that's the deepest part of us. The Holy Spirit dwells within and yokes up with our human spirits. Hence, we have a want to do the right thing planted down in our hearts and wills like never before. We have the power of the Holy Spirit's conviction planted in our wills like never before. We have a spark of truth and light planted in our wills like never before. And because we have a new spirit, we desire to live in gratitude. We desire to do the right thing. But in addition to this brand new spirit, we are soul, which includes our emotions and our minds, and we are body. Our souls need renewal, a constant download from above to transform our mind's old mindset. 
listen, no matter how holy we might think we are, don't get it twisted. We still have patterns of belief, traditions, habits, addictions that have formed since we've been little children. Patterns which sometimes are unlike God, are unlike the angels, and they're worldly and they're secular. And it's all at work in our thinking and believing. So we need a renewal of the mind, which changes this notion. When somebody gets at me, I'm going to get back at them. That's what my uncle taught me. When someone cuts their eyes at me, I was taught by my best friend to cut my eyes right back at them, even though I was only four year, years old. Someone who's not careful enough to protect what they've got, they don't deserve what they've got, and I might just take it. Some of this kind of thinking, erroneous thinking, is deeply ingrained, and it doesn't represent the new person who lives on the inside of us. So what am I saying? I'm saying our souls have to be renewed. Our minds have to be renewed so that our spirits, souls, and minds can work in harmony together to bless God and bless the world. And if you search the Hebrew scriptures and the New Testament, the primary ways that we renew our minds is by listening to the word of God. Jesus said that we are designed to live by every word spoken out of the mouth of God. The word of God becomes our new uh, primary nutrition deep down in our spirits. I can hear Joshua getting instruction from God. Joshua, if you're going to be successful as a new leader, meditate in my word day and night, and then you'll have good success. I can hear the psalmist in Psalm 19 reminding us that your law, O oh Lord, is perfect, and it converts, it renews the soul. Renewing our minds, setting aside time to hear the word of God should be primary. Renewing the mind also means praying without ceasing. Praying as if everything depends on God as we work out our situation like everything depends on us. I, I can hear Paul saying in another place, be anxious for nothing but by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known unto God with thanksgiving, and then the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I'm telling you, prayer is a part, prayer without, praying without ceasing is a part of the process of inner renewal. We, we renew our minds by listening to the word of God, by prayer, but also fasting, fasting, pushing away from the plate if your, if your health allows you to. And Jared, we're so glad to hear about you reaching a new milestone. And I, I'm trying to make sure that I'm right there with you walking in lockstep because there are certain uh, 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 diseases that we have in life that can make life very difficult. However, once we get the, cl the clearance from our doctors, we have to push away from the plate sometime. That, that's a part of inner renewal. And of course, worship. Worship, worship renews the mind. Doing the work of ministry renews the mind. All of these practice, if, practices, if done under the auspices of the spirit, renews our perception, renews our outlook, and changes our lives. What happens, pastor, as we renew our minds and our souls? By reading the word, by praying, by fasting, by doing the works of ministry, by worshiping God, Last week, we said that when we do renew, there will be three results. And one of them we've already developed last week, if you remember. There will be three results when we renew our minds. First, and this one we talked about last week. When we renew our minds, something about what we're able to take in life changes. In fact, when our minds have been renewed, like in the author's case, Paul's case, we will know that we have been given a divine cushion, a buffer, when life and the devil comes against us hard. When our minds are renewed, God toughens us up. 
And we will know that we know that we know that when Jesus is our constant inner companion, we have an internal buffer, a divine cushion and anointed insulation. I like that, anointed insulation. And, and even when we are afflicted, even when we are perplexed, we said last week, even when we're persecuted and cast down, knocked down, we are not destroyed. Secondly, secondly, and we did not talk about this in any, any detail last week, a mind renewed by the word and prayer and fasting and worship and service will give us a new and very different perspective on suffering, even our own suffering. And the truth is that we all have to endure suffering. Suffering is just part and parcel of this experience that we call life. Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have some trials and tribulations. However, you can be of good cheer. Why, Jesus? Because I have overcome the world. We, we've got to deal with suffering, though. One of the biggest lies told to the Christian world is that Christians won't suffer. That God will just always grant you health, wealth, and prosperity forever. All you've got to do is name and claim it and blab it and grab it. That's all you've got to do. World famous 19th century French painter, Jean-Léon Jerome, painted a series of paintings called The Truth Coming Out of Her Well. These paintings are beautiful. The Truth Coming Out of Her Well. And in his paintings, he's painted at least three of them, truth is depicted as a woman. Remember, he's from a different time. So I'm sure he was just painting out, his, out of his own understanding of male and female gender relationships. So there might've been a little sexism, but he depicts, he depicts a woman who has been stripped of her clothing. She is wounded, she is bruised, she's been battered and she's tired as she emerges from out of, out of a well. Mr. Lie had somehow encountered Miss Truth. And Mr. Lie had injured her and taken her clothes and put them on and left the truth for death, for dead, at the bottom of a well. And, and Mr. Lie then dresses up as the truth, goes into town, and he convinces everyone in town that he indeed was the truth. This is the story behind the painting. And when the naked truth finally climbs out of that well, tired and wounded and, and worn, and tries to warn everybody in the town that she indeed was simply the naked truth, Mr. Lie was all dressed up as the truth, and many believed him, forever letting us know that sometimes a dressed up lie temporarily goes further than the naked truth. Mm. Yes, Lord. With a renewed mind, we understand that Christians will suffer too. That's just the truth. But with a renewed mind, we can also know that much of our suffering can become redemptive suffering. Redemptive suffering, redemptive suffering. This is, this, this is, is the kind of suffering that as we suffer, we're suffering for a godly purpose which will help save and empower others. Redemptive suffering helps us and others to know that God can do powerful things, even through broken vessels, even when the pain is acute, even when the tears are wet and falling. And as God brings us through it, hope is birthed in others that God can bring them through it also. That's redemptive suffering. Jesus said that unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Th this is Jesus. I think this is Jesus' description of redemptive suffering. Injury, pain, and even death are all one, unwanted. They're all unwanted. Dying on Calvary's cross was unwanted. Marching among those water hoses and vicious German shepherds in Birmingham was unwanted. Paul's imprisonment was unwanted. Nelson Mandela's imprisonment, unwanted. Winnie Mandela's tough struggle and temptation, especially as she had to try to head up the ANC, the African National Con uh, uh, Congress, without her husband's leadership. She slipped. 
She made some serious mistakes and started her own reign of terror to some degree. And she caught a lot of heat. She suffered a lot of persecution and rightly so. But she struggled because her husband was jailed for so long. Our pain is unwanted. Rosa Parks being humiliated on that bus was unwanted. But sometimes, sometimes God uses these moments of indignity and hardship to glorify God's name. And so some suffering you might be going through right now, maybe it's a health struggle, maybe it's a mental struggle. It might not be for you at all. It might be that, at least in part, that you're going through what you're going through for someone who is coming this way in life after you and they're observing your walk. And so they need to see a model. They need to see an example of how to bear up under the pain or the scrutiny or the shame and see how you endure it so that they can endure it too. Oh, you check the bio of everyone who has been greatly used by God, the folks whose books we read, the folks who have nation, national holidays and streets named after them, the folks we listen to online, behind the faces, behind the voices, behind what appears to be the polish and panace, there's a lot of pain and suffering. There's a crucible which they had to endure. You know, George uh, Friedrich Handel was paralyzed on his right side at the height of his career, 40 years old, before he heard angels giving him the hallelujah chorus of the Messiah. And so paralyzed on the right side, he had to reach out from his left side and pull down melodies of heaven, which helped make his masterpiece. Beethoven went completely deaf. And yet as he struggled with his hearing, Somehow, miraculously, he heard notes in his work, Symphony Number no. 5, that were not on a printed page. He heard through invisible ears, ears that God gave him. And of course, y'all know about Black Moses, Harriet Tubman. What you might not know is she was beaten as a younger enslaved woman so bad that she ended up with a brain injury which caused her to faint periodically throughout her entire 90 something years of living. And yet she kept on liberating. She kept on delivering. She kept on being our source of courage and strength. Okay, last point as I close. I've been up too long, I recognize that. Last point as I close. Last point. A renewed mind has another benefit once we start God's renewal program, a strange phenomenon occurs. We soon begin to realize from the inside that we are compelled by the spirit to participate in God's renewal project more than from year to year, more than from month to month or week to week. But we come to the realization deep in our souls, maybe part of it is the hunger that we start developing for God once we realize we're part of God's renewal program. But, and we realize that I've got to be renewed day by day because real authentic renewal doesn't happen like a flash in the pan. It is more like a flame that is lit daily to keep the fire going. Our spiritual Renewal in Jesus is not a once upon a lifetime experience. It is not a one shot solves all experience, but by design, it was meant to take effect every day. Paul, the author of this letter, wasn't transformed into the apostle that he became in 24 hours. But he spent years praying and searching the word of God and fasting and doing the work of ministry until God kept pruning until God kept revealing, until God kept fine tuning who he was on the inside. Sisters and brothers, we need renewal, not from year to year, but we need renewal day by day. Because along with new mercies, there are always new challenges every day. There's new mess every day. There's new problems every day. There's new controversies every day. The Lord said, come unto me all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. And he didn't say, I'll do that only once a year. 
or I only do it once a month, but come unto me today and I will give you soul's rest. I will give you renewal. Isaiah testified that young men, strong young men and women will sometimes as they're running, they will get tired and they will faint. But those who wait on the Lord and Isaiah, the writer didn't say, we just need to wait on him every month. We need to wait on him every Sunday, but we can wait on him every day. And when we do, those who have been waiting on the Lord will mount up with wings like an eagle. They will run and not get weary. They will walk and not faint. Amen. But you know, you know what I'm still discovering? I am still learning that the more we renew our minds, the more we desire to dig deeper into the spiritual disciplines, and the more we dig deeper, the more treasure we will end up finding in our hearts and in our relationship with God. Because the deeper we dig into God's word and presence daily, the sweeter the reward. The deeper we dig daily, the sweeter certain aspects of life become, even in the face of trials and tribulation. The psalmist said in Psalm 19 that sweeter our relationship with God, our commitment to serving the word of God, sweeter than the honey in the honeycomb. That's what it's like. As I take my seat in a strange way, renewing our minds day by day kind of reminds me of the old Cracker Jack box of caramel popcorn with peanuts, especially as it was sold before 2016. 2016, the, the, the new owners of that company, they changed their process and they changed what they included with the whole package and it'll be clear soon. My parents, when we were younger, would buy a case of those little square boxes for my sisters and me when we were a certain age. And there was something about those little red and caramel colored boxes with the little sailor boy and his dog on the front of the box. For a while, we ate Cracker Jacks almost every day as a part of our lunch. And when we ate the Cracker Jacks, the excitement was not in that it was our favorite meal or our favorite sweet. It, it was good. It, it was sweet. And it was a consistent snack. And it helped provide a little nutrition with those peanuts inside. And it kind of made, uh, because it was just a stable little addition to our lunch, it kind of made our days a little brighter. However, what excited us more than anything, each day we grabbed a box, was not the sailor boy and his dog on the box. And it wasn't even the tasty mix of caramel popcorn and peanuts, which seemed to get sweeter and saltier the further we dug down in the box. What got us really excited was not the digging process. It was not the caramel. It was not the peanuts but it was the Cracker Box prize inside the box, which they included until 2016. The Cracker Back Box, the Cracker Jack prize was the treasure to be had on the inside. So, so every day, day by day, every time we had some available, we would grab a box and dig deep. And as we kept digging deep, we would be rewarded once we got to the bottom we would be rewarded with that treasure on the inside, which was our goal. Sisters and brothers, as we renew our minds, as we make sure we are engaging with God day by day, we dig deeper and deeper into the teachings of our faith. And as we dig, our faith walk becomes sweeter and sweeter. But as we learn more Bible, as we pray more prayers, and even as we occasionally fast, Our ultimate goal is to make sure that we're laying hold of that enterprise who is Christ in us, the hope of glory. Amen. Yahweh said to Abraham, look, I know that you're looking forward to having that son of promise. But don't forget, Abraham, I am your exceeding and great reward. After God told Abraham that, you know what Abraham went, how he responded? He said, yeah, God, all oh, that's good. But when are you going to grant me that son? God said, I am your exceeding and great reward. Yeah, God, that's fine. But when are you going to give me that son? Sisters and brothers, there's nobody greater than Jesus. Nobody can meet all your needs like Jesus. Nobody can soul you like Jesus. 
Nobody can deliver you like Jesus. Nobody can heal you like Jesus. Nobody can welcome you into glory like Jesus. He is our exceeding and great reward. Maybe there's one here today. You desire to give your heart to this treasure who works inside of us. His name is Jesus Christ. Make a commitment to Jesus today. You've heard the gospel. The Holy Spirit is moving in your heart. Maybe you've never linked up your heart with Christ. Maybe you have, but you need a church home. I recommend the Calvary Presbyterian Church. I believe God has us going somewhere mm -hmm. and we want you to travel along with us. Yes. Maybe you just need a, a reaffirmation of faith. Won't you come? You can call the number, area code 313-537-2590. It should be on your screen. Call the number and make your prayer concern or your discipleship concern known to our secretary, Pat Coleman. And she will get that message to us, to the leaders of this church, and we'll give you a call in return. Is there one? Is there more than one? Why don't you come forward? 